Hello and welcome to Steel City Business Uncut. The first episode of every month is where we dig a little bit deeper with an amazing guest in a raw, honest, largely unedited conversation. I'm James Marriott. I'm your host. I run an audio marketing business in Sheffield, which is called Sound Media. And on Steel City Business Uncut, I'm joined by co-host Stephen Kenwright, who was co-founder of Rise at Seven before exiting in late 2022. The show is recorded at the awesome studios at The Curious at Castle House in the heart of Sheffield City Centre. Right, let's do it. A warm welcome to Steel City Business Uncut. I'm James, Stephen's back with us. Hi, yeah. It's very camp, I like that. Yeah. And uh, our guest today, which is, I've been trying to figure out whether or not I describe this as the first returning guest from season one of Steel City Business. Because that technically, Stephen, was you, because you were on season one, and then obviously you've been back several times since. Not as a guest, though. Not as a guest, so I'm going to go with it. I'm going to say our first official returning guest, James Biggin, from how Steel City merchandise steel city marketing steel city marketing we kind of hide the marketing word because it's a bit fluffy and it's the legacy legacy name of the business from back in 1980 right so we try and inject merchandise uh, and branded merchandise in where we can to the name without having to do a major rebrand i I would argue anything that's prefixed with steel city is immediately amazing amazing so it's it's about four and a half years since we sat down and recorded the first podcast episode that, that that we did. And I mean, a lot has happened in that time. There was a pandemic, mm-hmm. but your business has changed a lot in that time as well. The world's changed a lot in that time. Uh, this is a really big question to start with, but fill us in on the last four and a half years. Wow. You, you've not got enough episodes, I don't think. It's been, <laughs> it's been pretty crazy, I have to say. I think we we clearly struggled during the pandemic. Uh, like most businesses did, um, but we would have been the first that probably cut uh, in terms of client spend, and and we felt it almost immediately. We tried to, uh, we tried to. Well, I suppose that that word of pivot. I didn't use it, but it was it was clearly an attempt at us trying to use that time to maybe go for uh, masks and and sort of PPE. It didn't it didn't work. It was never really going to work for for a company of our size. We needed probably warehousing and scale, um, but. Uh, we kept the team strong. Um, luckily, I play a very safe bat. What I've been about is keeping keeping a lot of investment back in the business. So rather than using it for lifestyle for for myself, it was made mainly to protect the business for anything that could have happened. A recession, a second recession. I've been through one before, and this was worse than that could have possibly been. So had I not had, I suppose, the strength in the balance sheet. I think we would have really, really struggled, but we didn't. We 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 didn't have to lay off any any staff apart from those those couple that that were probably not quite making it. Really, I would say is is the nicest possible way. And I think we tried to boost the team before that COVID hit, and probably it gave us an, an opportunity to look at the business and say it's really time to take it back to a a, a small core. Um, and those people have been with me for an exceptionally long time anyway. And so we did. And I think taking that step back uh, and, and then the tap coming back on at the end of at the end of that covid period when we were allowed to do things again was quite insane, really. Um, and had we not had that team in place, we got back into the office as soon as we could. I'm not really a fan of of remote working. I know a lot of companies are and they have the hybrid and all of these words that have come into the into play now and a lot of agencies, a lot of businesses can do that. I was we I was very much of the thinking as soon as we can be in that office, we get back in there. And luckily the team were behind that move as well. And so I think that really helped us to make sure that we knew everything that we needed to know about each other moving forward, what the businesses we were dealing with were going to be like to deal with, uh, how they were changing and what they needed from a uh, product point of view and a solutions point of view. And I think that was where everything's kicked back off really is that we took the team down to such a a neat, uh, compact unit 
and everyone was in the office together, that then we've just built it from there, built it back up from there because we, we survived. And that's a huge string to everyone's bow that was involved in that, in that, in that period, really. It's kind of weird looking back, isn't it? If 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 we, if we'd have known when we when we first kind of started recording a podcast together in 2019 that there was a pandemic around the corner, it would have been a very different conversation. Um, w- were there points within that that you questioned whether it would ever come back? Yeah, I, I, I honestly thought things would change forever. I thought I thought this was it, and and I suppose the doomsday side of most people's thinking back then, and what we were told, and how we were told to behave, and what we were told we were allowed to do, and clearly what we were not allowed to do, was almost like this. This is now it. But I, I kind of get got the feeling was, was I had to stick to a couple of my principles in terms of what I feel we are as a company and what we. Could, should continue to to keep doing. It wasn't a case of I wanted to change the business to something it it was never it had never been and could pros, possibly never be. And that's maybe me saying I'm not good enough to do that. And I still feel those feelings of imposter syndrome a lot of the time. Um, I can have a chat with you at an event and suddenly you're saying, oh, that'd be very interesting for a podcast. And then I think, well, I don't realize I've just said all of those things that you quite liked hearing from a content point of view but I think yeah from our point of view I had to stick to my guns and think well when that tap turns back on and and it did turn back on we need to be able to do what we do very very well and and luckily we do and we've just got better since we've got better at it and we don't need to to really try and think about adding layers of um, structure onto the offering that we have. We don't need to do more than what we do already. We we clearly don't because the, luckily the business is is is. I don't want to say the words success. I don't. We're doing well. We're all right. We're we're doing good. I don't like saying it. You, you genuinely look uncomfortable there, yeah. kind of um, saying that. I mean, I guess we should probably just for anyone that isn't entirely clear in terms of what it is that 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 you guys do. So. Um, tell me if I'm wrong here, if I kind of sum it up as it's, it's branded items. Mm. Yeah. How, how do you do that better than someone else? Because uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll be, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here, but I kind of think uh, you know, a branded item is a branded item. You know, a, a company that says, you know, we do pens, we do business mm-hmm. cards, we do, the, here's a catalog of the things that we can have your logo on. How, how can one business do that differently to another? So I think what we've realised over the last few years is if we, if we talk to people externally and through our marketing mainly, if we talk to people about just the items, no one cares. No one's going no to watch for that out on social media or watch a, a little video about, you know, look at this, it's great, isn't it? They're just not. We have to find our personality and we have to be authentic. And I think the authenticity of a business like ours comes across. We can't fake. We can't fake how we are and who we are as a team. And, and, and I can't fake how I am as an MD and, and as a boss uh, and as a colleague, as part of the team. And, and equally, I think we make sure that we don't bang on about the product. We, we can't do that. And if we do, we'll, we'll just be boring. We'll just be one of those companies that just says that. Um, I think what we uh, have found in our probably sweet spot which is what I I probably might highlight a few times in in different reasons that that it is a sweet spot is that we found that if we can get our personality across if we can get our experience across to people and that is to the existing clients that come to us and just want a bit of help they want some time saving marketing people are spinning plates all the time like to a to a ridiculous level but so many people are we understand by putting ourselves in their shoes, that they are spinning plates to a point where if we turn around and say, here's a brochure, will you have a look? That's not going to be of interest. If we say, go to our website and have a look, not of interest. We need to use a serious amount of expertise in my team of three to four, four salespeople really, um, about we will do that work for you. We know what you want as in we know what your uh, problem is, we know what you need us to try and find a solution for, we know what you've got coming up, we know what budget you've got, we found that out within seconds of talking to you. And at that point we go away and do that little bit of work to almost produce a a shortlist 
of items that we either know have worked before, we know you've liked before and you want to do again, or we know we know we can leave off the ones that you don't like. So if things haven't really gone down well when we've suggested them, it's important to find that out. We, we don't want to keep banging on about a certain product if you really don't like it. And I think that's that's the way that we we kind of set ourselves apart is that we know our competition don't do much more than put a blanket of ideas forward or a website and go and have a look or what do you want, Mr. Client? We will say that this is what you we what what we think will really work, and hit, and it's your choice. Then it's your choice to narrow it down, or can you narrow it down from that point? So I think the experience in the team is massive. Yeah. It's massive for me, and and it's it's worth its weight in gold. Somewhere in there, you mentioned about a conversation that we had at an event, mm-hmm. and that's what prompted us to get together to do this recording today. So uh, this is not a podcast about promotional no, items. No, no. Um, <laughs> you know, we've, we've got a kind of a direction that we're going to uh, go in. But I, I mean, I do love a branded item. I'll be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a geek. I enjoy an expo going around thinking, what can I get for free? Are you a fan of a pen? Less so a pen, to be honest. But I think, uh, you know, to your point, every business has got its own personality. And... I think it kind of strips some of that personality if you're giving out the same pen everyone else is giving out, another notebook, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And it's an opportunity to show off something that's that's kind of unique to your brand. So, you know, even my, my, my previous agency, we had some... I'm not going to say unique views on branded items, but certainly we do things that others wouldn't. So our first merchandise, our first clothing was a jumper. And that's not a really common, I think, agency and uh, item. You know, you certainly get hoodies, but maybe not jumpers. And the brief really for the for the designers working on it was make us something that you could buy off Misguided's website and make it rise at seven. The, we did a whole bunch of that kind of stuff, but the thing that I remember most and I think the merchandise that gets talked about most still uh, from from those days was the branded alcohol (laughs) and there's a few reasons for that right one being personality it was it was it was in line with what we would want to do the first item that we did was for our first birthday and it was a collaboration uh, with True North Sheffield Dry Gin so we made Rise at Seven Gin and it was, you know, labelled as being our first birthday, etc. Uh, lots of reasons for that. One being we wanted to showcase we're from Sheffield. But another being, and I think this is where expertise, like you're saying, is so important in the merchandising uh, environment. Like the reason we did that is to get around clients' bribery policies. Because we went to a Christmas time meeting with one of my favorite clients of all time, Park Dean Resorts, amazing people, walked into the lobby in their Newcastle office and wall to wall are hampers from Fortnum and Mason, from everywhere you can think of. And the client is not allowed to accept those. They get piled and piled in the in the lobby. There are, must be a hundred. I bet there are a hundred hampers in there. And every member of staff enters a raffle to see who might win some because they can't accept it. Now, I've been in-house, a client side, brand side, and our bribery policy was if it's merchandise, it doesn't count. You know, you can't accept a ticket for this or you can't accept a present over this value, etc. But if it's branded merchandise, then it's, you know, it's, it's very much part of the marketing of the agency that you're working with. So we couldn't give them a bottle of Sheffield Dry Gin, but we can give them a bottle of Rise at Seven Gin. Don't know why that works, but okay. that's what we did. And and, and I, I think that's that that's your point, James. This is right. It's the expertise, it's the thing that's not just you can choose that out of a catalogue. It's a how are we going to meet this specific requirement? And you know, it's not an a, not necessarily an item that you think that has a real strategy behind it, but it does. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. But I, I do like a pen. Just um, for for the record, my bribery policy is I'm all for it. I can be <laughs> bought off by anyone for, for anything. Um, no, so let's go back to uh, the event that James and you were at, at the, uh, I think it was the start of February, sadly at Bramall Lane, but we'll not get into that. Um, and uh, it was a it was a marketing um, event and, and we were just having a, a bit of a conversation. I can't even remember what prompted it because football, I think, was the start of that conversation. And it then led into a really interesting chat, which I would sum up as being about culture. 
but really it started with the was a conversation about your team and and kind of where your business is at. and you told me i can't remember exactly how long it was but you told me how long it was since you've had to recruit since you've had a member of your team leave and that then kind of led us into this conversation that i found really interesting about culture and i think it's this is something that we've touched on probably with every guest that we've had on in some way or another mm-hmm. but it's not something that we've really focused on and I find it really interesting because I just think there's so much bullshit around when people talk about culture and businesses that say our culture is really important, our people are really important, it's really important to us to look after our staff. But it doesn't take long to delve a little bit deeper and perhaps talk to a couple of members of those the staff at those places and they kind of go, yeah, well, they do this and they give us this for free and there's a free bowl of fruit on a Monday and we go to the pub after work on a Friday. But actually, it's just the same as everyone else that I've worked. Like if you ring up in the morning saying, I don't feel very good today, I can't come in. And they go, well, you've got to do because you've got this work to do. Or, or whatever that, that looks like. I've said similar stuff to that before on the on the podcast. But I think that's what I find really interesting is when we talk about culture, when we talk about caring about our people, when we talk about anything along those kind of lines, what does that actually mean? And what, what, where are we at kind of as a, as a business world, as a business community in, t- in terms of what, what is culture? What, what, what does it, you know, what, what does all this stuff mean? So let's go back to that conversation. Tell, tell me about your, your team. Well, I think what I was trying to get across when we spoke was that everything's, everything has to be completely natural. And I think that was where we ended up speaking from a point of view of because trying to get everything to a point where it's completely natural and you haven't had to force anything. And I think that's where we've got to with our group is that we're now two and a half years since I recruited. But most importantly for me, it's two and a half years since, um, well, no one's left in that period. And I think that for me is the biggest thing I can say right now over any metric in the business over any result that we've had over any sale that we've had is no if someone's asking me when I go out and meet people or we go to an event that that aspect is the one thing that I'm saying and I'm not saying for it for people to see that I'm doing bragging rights or anything like that it's not about that because as you can see I'm feel some, sometimes feel quite uncomfortable saying stuff that that either champions things or whatever I'm just not like that but if I look back and say what is the reason we are doing what we're doing and how well we're doing it it's because of that we have got to a stage now where we know each other so well our thoughts on the way over we're not boring but it's quite nice to feel that we could say that word but it mean a positive thing that we're very comfortable we're not interesting to a recruiting agency there's no point in a recruitment firm calling us and I don't mean that disrespectfully to them but I don't want to take a member of staff on I don't want to be a company that suddenly starts striving for massive growth because actually we're doing what we want to do right now we're safe the psychological safety of that building is unbelievable and it's been created over a probably a six-year period of not rushing, not necessarily feeling as though we're behind other people and other companies because you get a lot of noise. Like you've said, I'm, I'm, I'm very reluctant to say that anybody's getting things wrong or that, doesn't, or that the noise that comes out is, is not correct. But I know from our point of view that we are we are doing what we can do right for us. And I'm not then going to go out there necessarily and start saying, you must do this and this is the way to do it and this will work. And it, it, it can't happen. I can't do that. What I can just say is on reflection, what we've achieved is um, adding layers and layers and layers over a period of time has created as one of the most psychologically safe periods of my entire career since I left university however long that go and it was a very very long time ago and a group of people that know exactly what they're doing every second of every day without needing to be asked without needing to be checked it's calm it's very busy we are maxed out and we could probably think about adding the body count but that would change the culture almost instantly it would change everything and it would put something under pressure that I don't think needs putting under pressure. 
we've got now a stage where we've brought on a, uh, a young member of staff who's now wanting to be the fourth salesperson almost completely uniquely now. And, and that hasn't ruffled any feathers. And I just think, you know, we, we got to a stage where those layers now make it almost impossible for us to not feel really happy with what we do. And what I mean by the layers is we've not said the bowls of fruit, which is work, will work for some companies. We've not done that. It wouldn't work in our place. And it's not going to really be seen as valuable. Whereas we do, I think what I've managed to achieve is the realisation of what really works for us. We like coffee. So if we've hit a target, a certain target, we all get coffee. We don't have it delivered. I go out and get it. I walk up into town and go and get a coffee from a place we all like. Not, not sending somebody out, not asking each person to take a turn. Mm. We've hit target. I'm paying, or the company's paying, let's be honest. Um, but I go and get it. And I ask what everyone wants. And if it's the coffee and cake, I bring the cake back. If it's lunch, then we try and support local. Or, you know, that's a bit more difficult to make sure we're doing that. But we've added layers and layers and layers. Going back a little bit further than that, everything started when I took the team right down to a smaller size. Everything started with a team bonus. We hadn't had a bonus before that. This is a long time ago now. I wanted a bonus, but I didn't want to make it just about a few people. It had to be about the entire team. I don't think I copied anyone. Maybe I listened to a few people and listened to a few things that were going on back then. And maybe I just adapted it. Maybe I tweaked it. But I made sure that our team bonus, I worked the numbers out. Maybe, hopefully, I wasn't going to get it wrong. But made sure that every person in the business knew that if we hit a certain figure each month, they were going to get it. They were going to get that figure. I've been criticised a number of times why do you pay the bonuses out the following month when you probably aren't going to get paid for 60 days or your debtor days and your um, will, will be slightly longer than that? doesn't matter. We've got the order in and yes, things can be cancelled and things, but these guys make sure that that order will go through or if it doesn't, we know about it very, very quickly. So I've done that. I've made those decisions. Then I've added in individual incentives. Um, primarily for sales targets, it's got to be. But then those treats that I've been talking about, they matter because they're on a weekly basis. And and so you go through all of the layers that you add in, the perk boxes, the things like that, you know. I'm, we have got a lot of layers going on. Mm. There is a heck of a lot going on. And I don't need to sell the business to any member of staff any more than, than that. And then you you embed the fact that we, we are a team of people, like I've said, that just have that understanding of each other in in a most ridiculous way. Uh, something is just... And we haven't had to force anything. Nothing's been forced at any stage. Nothing's accident... N nothing, sorry, maybe it's some of it's accidental. Nothing's forced, but equally nothing's false either. And I think that's so important that nothing... I don't put anything in there that I don't think we are all behind. Was there a point where you consciously thought, I really want to work on the culture of the business? No. Or has this happened by accident? Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's real. If I sit down and I say, I'm just going to do some work on culture, for I'll be forcing it. 100% forcing something that's not going to work. And I've probably suggested a few things. And I mainly go out and find out what the what the vibe is and what the gut feel is. And I, I know very quickly if it does, it's not going to go down too well. Um, you know, Jenny comes to me, for example, and says, can we get some, should we get some staff workwear? Can we get some, can we, yep, let's do it. Can we make sure that it's not the uniform, everyone wearing the same thing? And can we make sure the little icons on the gar gar garment somewhere? That's all I want. Choose your colours, choose whatever. You know, those are the sorts of things that I absolutely don't mind. But if I try and go in and put my head into culture... I'm going to come out with, well, such and such do that because I'm going to have to start listening to people. I'm going to have to start delving into things. I'm going to have to start researching. I don't need to do that. I need to look in the four walls that we've got and say, are we okay? Are we good? And is everybody feeling like they're getting what they want out of the business and they're feeling safe? 
and they're feeling as though they've got, uh, they're respected for the work they do and they're thanked and they're rewarded and they get the little treats. I, yeah, I, it's, it's ac- some of it's accidental. I completely agree. I'm not going to say that I've got the manual that says anything. Accidental, a lot of it. Yeah. Where, where, whereas uh, it, have I ta- I've taken a lot of time so this, I can't force this. So I have to make sure I think that this just evolves. It's something's got to evolve over a long period of time. And if I try and make it happen too quick, it'll, it'll snap in some way, I think. I think, this is my opinion. What's your take on culture, Stephen? Uh, so I, I, lots of stuff I agree with and a few things that I don't. And I think it's, you are absolutely right. It depends on the business and the type of business. And and I think like when you're talking about, you know, you could do some work on culture, a lot of the time that's usually for the purpose of changing something that's just not working. And it's usually fundamental on a business level. Cultural change is going to be the thing that makes it possible to turn around a failing business most of the time. Mm. If you're not a failing business, if things are going pretty well, actually, then your cultural work is often just sort of dealing with repercussions of something that's happened somewhat accidentally. Mm. Um, and, and again, you know, it comes down to your point of forcing it versus what just sort of naturally evolves. I think of a lot of instances, particularly over the past few years, and particularly in, in the marketing space, especially the digital marketing space, where we, we had uh, a lot of younger people entering the workforce and a lot of the agencies decided that the best way to motivate those people might be extrinsically so to a degree money but certainly titles promotions etc and you know you 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 get more of what you're celebrating as a business so when your whole monthly update quarterly update or whatever is about these promotions that people have got you create a culture where people demand promotions they demand a lot of promotions to the point where we've had people in in my last business saying i want to get promoted twice this year and, you know, parts of the business are like, well, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's certainly not something that you really want people to strive for. But at the, second po- at, the se- at the same time, it's like we've created that monster and that's because we are trying to force an aspect of the culture where we're trying to get people to strive, to progress, to take on more responsibilities and to take on more, you know, learning on their own, on their own back. So I think, you know, when you, you kind of, you hear a lot of people paraphrasing P- Peter Drucker saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's somewhat true, but culture is just a manifestation of strategy. You've got to think about what kind of culture you want and exactly as you said, let it evolve naturally. When you try and force things, you usually try and force square pegs, round holes mm-hmm. and all that kind of thing and you end up creating a lot of work for yourself. But done right, it's a superpower for sure. James, can be careful how... First, this. Do you? If I was in your position, my my number one fear would probably be, uh, okay. So I'm I'm really happy with the culture. I'm really happy with the team. But does that mean that we're standing still? Is that a fear then of of growth? Which means the way that you've done it. If you get to a point where you have to bring in someone else, can all those plates come crashing down just as naturally as they started spinning in the first place? Yeah, I think I do. I do accept that. I'm not probably sat here in a, a an MD's position that sounds like I'm being ambitious. Uh, but I think for me, we have grown. So that isn't that that is a, a black and white set of numbers that I've been looking at over the last few years to say that we, we've done it anyway. We've done it regardless. And maybe maybe initially there's the bounce back after COVID, but then you've we've achieved what we've achieved from a set of a set of people who exactly understand what they need to be doing and achieving and and maybe don't want those positions where they're where they're probably demanded more of what it gets to is is you can start to say yes there's going to be x and y but there's going to be need to be level very much different conversations with those people and they might not be ready for that they might be if you start to say so completely take the point of view of pushing people to learn and go for promotions and go for that but if you've got a group of people that you know as almost family and you say right does that person is that person going to want the levels of demand on them 
that comes from that next, whatever comes next. So if we want to do a significant push for growth, that person is going to have a lot more expectation put on their shoulders than is currently on there. And I think I, I probably do come across as boring and negative about the way I look at it. But I also know that those conversations haven't had to happen, but yet people have still grown. Business has grown. And actually what I feel is the most important thing is psychological safety. Someone once said a long time ago, you've seen like you've got a psychologically safe business. And I thought, oh, I'd love to write that down and just keep looking at that. I would love to just have that message from that person and keep reflecting on it. Have I made that the case? Have I made that the case? Have we made that the case? But then you put some incentives in place for per people to then say, well, actually I can move on or I know there's something out there if I can achieve it. I think, I think, you know, that, that does, it does seem to just work, but probably from, from what you've just described in terms of those agency sides, you come back to maybe the fact we're all a fingerprint and every business is a fingerprint and we could take this into sport. We could take this into business. Everything is different. And I don't think you could apply the same models to, to two even similar companies and make them both successful mm -hmm. because everything is completely different. I think you, you can kind of underestimate how much of this difference between businesses does come from the owner, the founder, right? Because I, I, I've frequently said first and foremost, what your business should be doing is what you want it to do, right? So if the priority for you is growth and then grow. If the priority for you is safety, then that's the kind of business that you should build. And it's not just a, a, a blueprint for any of those things. Everyone is a mixture of all of these different things. There is a level of requirement that people do have in terms of how safe they want to feel at work. And, you know, all profit comes from risk. So there's got to be some level of risk in the business. But actually, that might well be that everyone feels comfortable and like they're not going to get blamed and they've got the opportunity to take some risk where it's appropriate to do so and there's going to be a scale of that where one business is happy to let people roll the dice and and put half the company on black and one bit of the business one other business is going to be like within these parameters by all means do something creative try something and if it doesn't work it doesn't work but a lot of that does come from the individuals who are who are leading the business and that's why it gets really interesting when you've got founding teams you've got management teams who all have their own opinions and it's ultimately trying to mesh all of those personalities like you said mm. together in a way that everyone's happy with what the business is becoming and that's that's ultimately why it gets quite hard to do this kind of do the culture work because at the end of the day when you are a, a, an owner you are the sole owner then you're able to or, or, or you know a very close team you're able to just impart your personality, the kind of things that you're talking about, just go to the coffee place everyone likes, go and do that, no expectation of that. That's the that's the bit that I want to leave within the business. That's the kind of reward I want to do, that you've taken just the sort of thing that you would do, right? It's not just a an act that's trying to prove a point. It's a thing that's part of your personality that you take into the business. It, it's very easy to do that when you've got a, a small, tightly knit management team. It's much harder to do that when you've got some people who are like that on a management team and some people who are completely different, who have a different agenda, mm -hmm. never necessarily thinking consciously about doing things differently. But they're different people. That's just how it is. Yeah, and I think as well for a company of our size and where we've come to in terms of structure, it, it does, and you talked about management teams, which so just got me reflecting, it, it has felt lonely for a very, very long time. And I don't mean that we're not a close-knit team. I mean, as my role and my position within that and my protective way I, I feel as though I am about the business itself as an entity, but also the people, it, it is a very, very, very lonely place to not have... Um, a, um, a person that you've, you're almost a, a co-shareholder with or a co... You know, it is. But I wouldn't want to change that for anything, but that makes a lot of those decisions hard. And it makes it, 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 makes it very, very hard to think beyond how we are and say, well, what could we do? What should we do? Mm. Because I'm almost talking to myself. The, the noises that go around in my head day after day, week after week, I have to try and not do that. Otherwise, I'll send myself loop, completely loopy because I haven't got that person that's either going to challenge me as a co-owner 
for example, if that was the case, to say, well, we've got to push for X million. Uh, well, okay, I have to make a lot of decisions, most decisions on my own. I've not, I've not got that that ability to, to to maybe think big, like you were describing, like management teams can. So, yeah, it, it also means like it's you. It's like I, I've just come from a uh, this morning from a I, I think officially like a, a business kind of networking thing, but actually it's kind of like a counselling session. Mm. A few of us sat around the table just talking about stuff. Um, and there's a wonderful human being called Dave who um, who led that session, who said um, you can sum up the culture of pretty much any company uh, with the with with the phrase "it's you." in terms of the the leaders of it you know everyone's really happy well that's you um people don't like such and such that's it's you that's a huge amount of pressure when it it is literally just just you what i'm really interested in is w- what happens next at some point you have to recruit something surely is going to happen at some point and the the makeup of that team the makeup of the business is going to change how how do you get that right? And do you want to just keep it exactly the same? Or if the opportunity came up and you thought, we can change things a bit here, we can do things a bit differently, would how would you feel about that? So I think there's a, there's a few things that I think are going to happen reasonably quickly, is that um, I'm fortunate that um, our marketing person has has wanted to and, and uh, has now started to up her, her hours again. So that's going to allow us to do more with that role mm-hmm. and do some nice stuff. So make that. I always feel as though I'm I'm probably the the blocker on on marketing is that I want to do so much or I want to do more things, but I end up being that one that sort of maybe slows down a couple of things on the marketing side. So if if we have got more time, then I've got to force myself to to be that. If it's the case that we do what we both set out to do on the marketing side and primarily I think and I appreciate I've got to be a bit forward facing on that from from the noise and and the messaging we send out there that and that's cool I don't mind that um I think that will naturally expose us to a lot more companies than we have dealt with before um the next side of it is that we've got a couple of three of us that have been in the sales side of the business for so long now that we are peaking out client wise and and we've done it retention wise and the new client that's, that comes through they usually are very sticky and that's a, and it, so lucky to be in that position and we're building through um a younger member of the team who is building a very nice client base now who will be ultimately what i feel is our short term growth so we bring that person through for the next two years in terms of a growth plan and you will automatically start to have that fourth person as a full out client facing person who is building clients, retaining clients, bringing new people on board and then you backfill. So you backfill into the production team, you backfill and say, well, We've got to make sure, and, and that will probably be done in a similar way than we brought her on, which would be down the apprentice route. I know it seems so simple, and it just, but as long as we can add that support network within the team to make sure that the jobs are fulfilled correctly and our client journey is respected and our client journey is um, kept as tight as it is right now, then the growth will come, I think the growth will come naturally over the next few years. Beyond that, I don't know, I'm going to turning a big birthday in a couple of years and I'm just I don't know I don't I don't know what my next stage is really I don't know what personally but I think we can we can very comfortably increase where we are now and and make sure that we enjoy that ride really it's a bit safe still it's a bit boring isn't it <laughs> it, it, it's, it is really interesting and I think I think you're a very different guest actually to anyone that we've had on before and that makes things really really interesting Th- there is two other things that i wanted to talk to you about which were a little bit off topic but i'm not going to move on until i'm sure that you know if there's anything else that Stephen wants to talk about or, or raise or questions that he wants to ask i was i'm i'm curious because you, you talk about psychological safety being such a big part of the business but then there's the tension also that you mentioned about being a solo owner i'm curious to what extent you feel that 
your priority of making the team feel safe has led to you feeling like the risk is all on you and the hard decisions are all on you like to, to what to what extent actually you're protecting the team and actually taking on a lot of stuff that that makes it harder for yourself totally agree you've pinpointed that right away uh you know if you're gonna get me to uh feel a little bit emotional you've probably just done it uh, <laughs> i feel i've i feel i do have all of that on my shoulders i don't want it any other way I feel like a parent not just at home and and a husband and and uh, a son and whatever and a brother but i i do feel when i step in there that i have the responsibility to make sure that the pressure is as much on me as it possibly can be the guys know that they deal with problems and issues and whatever they they know they've got the the, the freedom to to handle things to quote to do everything that they need to do within their role but if the push comes to shove um I'll lie down in front of them and take the hit and I'll do that every single day. They know it. It doesn't have to happen. It doesn't need to happen. They will know that I'll do it. Um, and, and I feel, yeah, there's, there's definitely a challenge in my head of coping with that. And I don't think I cope with it all the time. Brilliantly. I lean on people here and there, uh, that just get the, get that side of me a little bit. And, and probably, uh, uh, I'm very grateful that some people are around to help me, but it spins with my spins through my head 24 hours a day that I have got the pressure of this on my shoulders and I wouldn't have it any other way because of where we are, but I know it, it does affect me a lot. It, it affects my head a lot. It's tough. Yeah, it really is. And we talked a little bit about, you know, having co-founders or, or management teams or whatever. There's only a certain amount of that that can be mitigated from from that because everyone's different. I think one of the, the best things that I ever did or the best, best people I ever hired in my last business was my executive assistant, Ella, who was brilliant, right? Because she, from my psychological point of view, knew everything about the business. She managed my email inbox. She wasn't necessarily going to offer me advice on anything. And if I asked her, she would probably refuse to offer me advice mm. on anything. But Ella and I went for lunch once a week, literally just because as an owner, having someone who actually knows the things that you can't tell everyone else, mm. the things that are half formed thoughts or the things that are risks coming along the road somewhere, but who knows where, et cetera. But someone who knows all of those things makes such a big difference. And that's why in, in a situation like yours, it's, it's fortunate, it's lucky that you've got the support network outside of work. It's not all just about the people within work. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that um, a lot of, you know, first time founders especially kind of get wrong. They, they are somewhat married to the people within their management team and they're the only people that can help but actually it's just about having those outlets and those people that you can trust regardless of whether they really know everything about your solutions yeah. or whether actually they just know the problems and that's that's a big step mm. i think yeah I, I feel like we're just getting re really into some meaty stuff and i'm going to change the subject to something completely irrelevant but i'm also aware of the time two of the things that i wanted to talk to you about one is is running which i think mm. is something that's really integral to you but you've just come back from something incredible so i want to talk about that in a moment first of all let's talk a bit let's talk let's talk about social media let's talk about tiktok because mm. when when we uh, recorded four and a half years ago you were and i mean this is nice you were just a business owner you're a guy that owned a business since then you've you've kind of in, in your own little way gone on to become kind of like a social media superstar and the the reason i find this funny is partly because i knew you'd get that kind of reaction where you shake your head at me but um also the fact that i don't see you as someone that's particularly egotistical that's particularly kind of desperate for everyone to know who you are or anything like that and maybe not so much of it now but certainly during some of the covid years and perhaps coming out of the covid years you were very public facing in terms of the social media stuff that your business was doing you were, you were trying to do things quite differently. You were trying new ideas. People were talking about it. I, I went to a business breakfast where you were doing a talk that was just about your approach to social media. It was almost as if people stopped, like, no one cares about your business. It's just like, this is James, and he does all the, the, the TikTok things. How You're kind of looking back over that and, and, and the fact that you went quite heavily into, into that. How, how do you feel about all that looking back now? 
I, it, it's been brilliant. And like you said, I'm glad you said the things you said because um, I wanted, never wanted it to be about anything other than if I can make one person smile. And it, and it was accidental. I tried a couple of things and suddenly it was people saying, oh, we liked that. And it wasn't then me thinking, right, I need to expand and, and do it in a different way. It was more, let's make, let's make some people smile in a really tough time. And let's do that first. And, 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 and I, sorry, I want to do that, not let's do that. I want to just make someone smile. And I need to as well, actually. I need to have a bit of fun. I need to feel as though I've got something that I can do that's going to add a bit of value to someone's day. No more. It wasn't about people then saying we want to deal with this company. And I absolutely promise you that. But I think that it wouldn't have done it. It wouldn't have come across as well if it had been anything like that anyway. So again, I come back to a bit of authenticity. This was me just being me. And, and what I also liked about it was not only was I doing some daft stuff and clearly, clearly it was silly, some of it, but people were starting to get to know me as a person, but not with me having to say anything not with me having to come on and do the whole video thing of, I, hello, I am me and this is about me and I'm going to talk about me now. I, do, it, I find those really hard and I couldn't do them anyway. So the main thing is that people started to learn a little bit about me over time now to a point where I think night quite happily, people do know who I am, but I haven't had to say anything. They do know that now I crowbar in product and I'm very clear about that. And I make something just a bit funny and say, yeah, but did you notice that I put a stress ball in there? You know, I'm very unapologetic about that. And, and also whilst I'm doing them, the staff opinion of, my, of me is obviously what it is, is that he doesn't mind people taking the mickey out of him. And I don't, I've never, ever minded anybody just, you know, using me as a bit of the the reason to have a laugh. And it doesn't upset me, but equally I can, I know that I can go into the meeting room, do 50 takes of a video that actually isn't working whatsoever. The guys aren't thinking, oh, what's he playing at? Why isn't he doing some work? They're probably just thinking, this is actually really, really, really quite nice that he can just do something that we could never do and have a bit of a laugh at himself and scream and shout because it's not working. Um, And that's been the reason. And that's been the whole way of doing it over a long time now to a point where I'm probably a bit, a bit exhausted from it all. And I don't do it as much now because I find it a little bit of a challenge to get them in the first place. And I do want to mature it a little bit. I want to mature our, our way of getting our message out to people and our personally out personality out to people. But yeah, I think, does that all right? Does that make sense? It, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of reluctant was was a word I probably didn't use in the way that I phrased that, that I probably should have done in terms of the fact that, you know, as I say, it didn't, it never came across as, here's a guy that's really desperate for the limelight and wants everyone to know anything. Uh, and it did all feel quite organic. And I, I think what, what you did very well was you gave people a little bit of a snapshot into that kind of culture that we talked about at the beginning. And I do see there's a, a relevance there and that and that um, authenticity, that word's come up a few times, mm-hmm. hasn't it? it? It very much does come across like that. But then there's also this question in terms of, well, how sustainable is that? Because you know, as, a, as a business, you mature over time, don't you? Mm-hmm. And, you and you grow up and things get busier and, and priorities change. And we all probably get a little bit bored of doing the same stuff all the time. And something that was fun two years ago might now not feel as, 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 as much the same. So it's really interesting hearing you, um, you, you talk about that. Um, I've always thought Stephen would make a great TikTok star. I've actually never been on TikTok. I've I've never been on TikTok. Yeah, I think I downloaded it temporarily. I'm one of those people who watches TikTok a week later on Reels. So yeah. I'm I'm happy with that. And and primarily because the the function of TikTok for me is I op- I open uh, reels when someone sent me a reel and I browse a little bit longer and I send them some reels and send some reels to some other people. Mm. So I guess it's exactly the same, right? That's that's kind of what TikTok's supposed to be. I'm just doing it on Instagram. Mm. But I've I've always been uh, I, I I've kind of flirted with the limelight and the background with my various businesses, and I think I'm probably a little bit similar to you where it's sometimes necessary. It's helpful in a lot of circumstances. But it's not always you that needs to do it. There's, there's sometimes someone else who does 
want to fulfill that role in my last business that was certainly the case my my first agency you know the the business came from the new business came from the founders uh or one of the founders patrick and um and my boss tim who were out there doing what we used to call thought leadership and talking on conference stages and talking on videos and that kind of thing and it's just really obvious i should do that because that's clearly what this vis- business values and again it comes down to culture right it's it's i could see from a mile off that the way i progress is by having some thoughts and explaining those thoughts to other people as an English graduate, uh, I'm more of a writer usually. So that's usually the medium that I, I choose. I go down the the blog thing, old school, a little bit compared to TikTok, I think. I didn't know you were an English graduate. That's interesting. Uh-huh. I have a master's in Shakespeare. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Gosh, right. Okay. We've wow. only got, we've got less than 10 minutes left. We can't, <laughs> we can't get into this now. No, let's Separate not. podcast in there, um, in there somewhere. If we don't call it thought leadership, what do we call it now? Uh, personal it, it, brand. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Fair and enough. I think, that, right, let's not go too deep into this, but there was an inflection point where the thought became less important than the person having the thought. And that's when personal brand became the thing. It's not about who's had this profound thing said this week. It's about what has Stephen Bartlett said this week. And it comes down to distribution. It comes down to audience where you've got these people who now have millions of followers, the Gary Vaynerchuk's, the Stephen Bartlett's, etc. They could say whatever the fuck they want to say. It doesn't really matter because people are very tuned into them. Yeah. And it's about that personality. It's about that uniqueness that they have. And it's about the way that people feel just by listening to the stuff that they do. Whereas without wanting to seem like I'm really old, you know, back in back in the days of growing my first couple of businesses and actually, you know, like, like with yourself on TikTok, like with them, um, several other businesses that I can point to that are doing some really cool stuff with this kind of thing. It's like, if we have the right kind of intentions and good thoughts, then it does break through. It's not all about this kind of impenetrable glass ceiling of you've not got a million TikTok followers, so it doesn't count. It's yeah. it's just a different way of doing things. And I think there's still, there's still a lot of room for thought leadership for people even yeah. who don't have a million followers. We keep coming back to the word authenticity, don't we? But it's just so important with with, with stuff like that, absolutely. Um, James, you are our second guest in as many months who is um, doing this podcast, having just returned to the country Mm. from you've been in the States. Tell us why. So I was lucky enough to qualify for and then run the Boston Marathon. Wow, this is this is just mind blowing. As as we've talked about other what we would deem as more important stuff for the last fifty odd minutes, and then we just drop into conversation. The fact that you do this, you, you're you're a serious runner, aren't you? Like we we talked, we we had the um, the founders of, of Gravitate on um, mm. a, a recent episode. We talked a little bit about Sheffield Running Club mm. um, and and a very kind of casual approach to to running. I, you know, I would class you as being a real level above that. Well, I run with them, so I'm I'm enjoying the Monday nights. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I guess it, you're gonna you're gonna try and get me to say stuff that I'm gonna big myself. I'm not. I don't see it. So yeah, but I do run, and I've I've run, I've run a lot over the years now. Um, Post pre COVID, probably played a lot of squash. I've I've done a lot of sport, so I've always had sport through school and then since. Um, running feels to me to be the one that I can do and and enjoy most because we've got the dog. We can go out to the peaks, but I can equally go. Luckily, I'm I'm still fit and healthy to be able to go and and put, probably put together a marathon plan. Um, but so is my wife Rachel. But putting together a training plan um, and actually um, having qualified from the York Marathon two years ago and and got the time that I could apply, uh, we went for it and and both got in, even though they then chopped the time by another five minutes. So they were pretty harsh to make sure that they still only had the 30,000 people um, enter. So it, it it is the marathon of marathons. It's a, it's the most iconic 128th running of it this year. So wow. it's the, the the biggest annual marathon in the world, and it is a level above anything I've ever experienced. It was bucket list. It was bucket list being there, and and I thought it was going to be big. I didn't know how big it was going to feel until we landed. There's a huge amount of history as, associated with it, even in in, in recent yeah. um, years, for obvious for obvious reasons. Does I mean does does running one marathon feel different to running another marathon because it's the same length, isn't it? You know, it's 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 just running. Did did it feel different doing it? Yeah, so I did, I did the London a, f- a long time ago twice, and I didn't really run to a plan. And then I did York to a very specific running plan, and got my sub three, 
which was, I, I thought I was going to just get close. I, I, I ended up, you know, five minutes under. But that was everything came together over the period of time leading up. And it is my, it's not an obsession. It is my way of breaking away from, from work and getting maybe that mindset. Something on my own or something with family or something with friends and going out and doing it. And, and I was very, very specific on how that one went. It's a lot more difficult when you've got a 16-year-old boy and a 19-year-old girl Ch- um, the, the children have got a lot going on so it was it was a little bit more difficult and I've aged a couple of years since I qualified but I trained as if I was going to try and hit the same sort of time um, going and doing that one though compared to everything I've done before I've done that's my fifth I cannot describe what that was like and and being there in the couple of days before the city celebrates it and then going and I was in the first wave going out Yellow buses, 45 minute bus ride, hundreds of buses taking the the first wave of 7,000 of us out. And we were all in a baseball pitch waiting for to be taken out. Star Spangled, Star Spangled Banner was sung by, I think, an X Factor singer mm. um, on a big screen. Everyone silent, stood up, hands on chest. And I was looking around going, this is insane. The silence around this pitch of everyone looking at the screen. Two F-35 jets fly over you. They were going straight into Boston within seconds and we were going to have to take uh, maybe three hours. And it, and and then uh, the crowds. I've never experienced noise like it. And all the way along, it's an it's a straight line route from Hopkinton through six cities to, to Boston. And I've ne- I just never experienced anything like that. And it broke a lot of people because 22 degree heat, Newton Hills, yeah. Heartbreak Hill. They, t- they talk about Heartbreak Hill being the killer. And it, it took a lot of people out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is there a different feeling to the Boston Marathon because of what happened? Um, looking back, obviously, the bombings, I can't remember how many years ago they are now, but still, still relatively recent in, in the great scheme of, of things. Is there a sense of, of, of that and a sense of, of extra kind of emotion attached to that event because of that? Yeah, there's definitely the emotion. You can see you can see around the city centre, you can see the, the, the sort of um, the, 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 the monument, I think there's the, there is something to do with retrievers and a dog that either passed away or was, uh, but they, there's a celebration of golden retrievers bizarrely, and I right. think that's related to the bombing. And then I, I think there's daffodils and there's a lot there's a lot of sharing. And then yeah, you, you've got you've clearly I mean, I, and the security, the security, but probably the same as London. The security is high, really high, but loved that really respected that you can't knock it the army that's around the police but they bring something extra to it as well all the way along there's army and you're seeing the proper u.s army you're seeing the proper u.s police as you're running past huge crowds and 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 but i think the city may it's probably always done it but the city celebrates that race and the country probably celebrates that race beyond anything i think as uk runners we can fully understand until you're there it was bucket list. It was an un- unbelievable experience. Do you want to tell us your time? I got three eleven forty three. So I was very respectful. yeah. I was, I'm really pleased. I was yeah. I was top five thousand. Okay. So what, what what comes next? You've done the Boston Marathon. I probably probably have to fill a void because I can te- definitely tell the blues are kicking in, and I think I've got to maybe think. Well, we've got um, a couple of off road things, so maybe maybe enjoy the sun, the summer, hopefully, with uh, going off road and enjoying being out with a dog, and and maybe we're going up to Lake District and stuff. But I've got a little eye on York again. It's October, uh, it's flattish, and it, it is one that I think I do want to try and maybe see if I've. As a 49-year-old, I can dip under three hours again. Uh, and then I'll hit another age category the year after that. So, See, I assumed it was your 30th that was... I know, I know. I just look so young, don't I? <laughs> uh, we, we have run out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Um, look, do, do us a favour. When, you know, when, when that situation comes round and someone leaves or for whatever reason you have to recruit a member of staff... Will you come back and chat to us about you know what what how that was how you found it and what difference it's made? Yeah, sure, and I hope it doesn't happen for a very long time. But yeah, uh, if you see me too soon, then it's happened. Uh, but maybe, may, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd happily talk. You know, I, you know, I like talking. Well, James, thank you, Stephen, thank you. Cheers. 
Thanks very much for listening to this episode of Steel City Business. It's been really lovely to have you with us. Now, you know how this works. If you've enjoyed it and you want in on future episodes, then just follow us on your podcast app or on YouTube. The show is very active on LinkedIn. Just search for Steel City Business and come and connect with me as well while you're at it. Big thank you to The Curious for helping make this podcast happen. There's loads more about the show at steelcity.business and you can get in touch by emailing james at steelcity.business. And hey, if you're in business in Sheffield, then, well, why not put yourself forward as a guest for a future episode? And of course, we're always open for a good chat about how audio marketing could work for your brand. Until next time, thanks for listening.